I'm Dan Goods, and this is David Delgado. Hey guys. Hi. And uh, <laughs> hi there. Hi. You. And Thank you. good morning. And so uh, we both uh, get to work at this amazing place. It's right up the road. It's called uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. And uh, there's about five, 6,000 uh, different people there. It's a big, big campus. And uh, for those of you guys who don't necessarily know what happens in that weird compound, a lot of really cool things happen. Uh, we make robots that uh, land on Mars. Uh, many of our friends uh, made the different pieces that, that help do that. Uh, we uh, develop telescopes that look at stars and galaxies far away. And uh, one thing that most people don't know is that we actually study the Earth as well. So there's about 19 satellites that help us uh, understand our oceans and our atmosphere and, and other different aspects of, of our Earth. Uh, but our journey sort of getting there actually started here. And uh, first day of class or uh, uh, orientation, I had forgotten my keys and uh, David was sitting right next to me and he gave me a ride home and to start a great uh, journey and friendship uh, together. And uh, while I was at Art Center, we, uh, I had this uh, crazy instructor and I was trying to do branding for a grocery store. And uh, it was a little um, uh, place in Highland Park. If you've ever been to Galco's, it's an amazing place. They have 500 kinds of soda. But I was uh, really struggling because I'm no good at logos. Uh, being a graphic designer is uh, sort of difficult. Um, but my instructor, this guy, Roland Young, he's sort of this old sage fellow. And, and he, he said, Dan, uh, you're too practical. And in fact, you're so practical that you just need to go play. And you're so practical that you'll take the impractical things that you do when you play and you'll make them practical. And it took me a little while to kind of like sort through what he was saying, but he said, go play. So I thought that'd be awesome. So I started to play around with bottles because the bottle is the essence of this place. Because if you have a, a glass bottle, they use sugar cane in it, and it also tastes much better than an aluminum can. So I started to just kind of play with, with this idea of what could I do with bottles and started to, you know, think, oh, I could put them on top of their building and light them up in different ways. And, and I love the way that a bottle makes noise, right? You blow on it. Ooh. So I thought, you know, could we put it on top of my car and make music? And, and that, that didn't work. I don't know if you can do that. Uh, got my friends, started kind of pushing around. But I'm really, uh, I'm really di diligent. And, and so, uh, so eventually I got the right angle and the right distance. And it, and it makes a beautiful noise at about 25 miles an hour. It goes, woo, 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 woo. And, and thought, by the way, this also became a theory of the universe. <laughs> yes, Holy exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm a scientist I can write to. So. Um, and so I thought, wouldn't it be cool to make a taco truck stand, you know, drive around, it could make music. And, and, uh, and then my friend, she has perfect pitch. And she went around all the different bottles and, and she made a scale, musical scale. Uh, but this is like part of my life is that in our lives, we don't actually know how to do anything. We kind of <laughs> come up with ideas and try to figure out how to do something from it. And so I thought, wouldn't it be cool to make a pipe organ? And, and uh, this was the extent of my drawing, too. And, and uh, I didn't know what you know, various parts were. I knew you needed a keyboard and some other stuff. But uh, talk to the right people, <laughs> and you find the answers. That happens to be a solenoid. I didn't know it, but I, I knew it somehow deep within myself. <laughs> and um, what's amazing is this, this crazy little project here ended up, uh, I ended up getting an in internship at Caltech for a summer. And it's really actually what helped me get my job at JPL. And what happened is I ended up meeting um, the director of JPL and I had like two seconds to sell myself. And I said, wouldn't it be awesome to have artists involved in brainstorming future missions? And he's like, that's great. And then, then he has to get to his next meeting and he walks away. I mean, he literally <laughs> walks away. And so I'm like, how am I going to get a hold of him? And um, I've been sending my resume in next day air because, um, slow down, I'll slow down. Okay. Well, I only have 20 minutes. So I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. So um, uh, I've been sending resume in next day air because nobody throws away next day air, right? You always open it up for, you know, you wouldn't throw away a FedEx. And so um, uh, my, I wasn't around, but my wife was around. And she ended up, they didn't have any letter size envelopes. They only had gigantic envelopes. <laughs> and so she sent it anyways. He got this giant envelope <laughs> with a little resume in it. And, uh, <laughs> and he sent it on to some people. And, and they brought me in. And they said, you know, uh, maybe you could do animations for us. You go to an art school. You must know how to do that. And I don't know how to do that. But I said, yes. I'll do whatever I can to work at a place like this, 
but you see this bottle project that I have? This is what I'm passionate about. And uh, it was sort of a big risk. And uh, he, he, uh, he took a risk. Hey, guys. <laughs> Audio works. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So um, can everyone hear me? I know that you can hear them. Uh, <laughs> now we just need a microphone. Yeah, awesome. We just need a microphone. That's yeah, fine. Um, okay, stick with me here. Stick with me here. Okay, so, so, um, so I, I, asked, I told them, you know, this, this sort of weird investigation is what I love to do. And he said, you know, I don't quite understand what it is that you do, but I will give you six months and we'll see what happens. And uh, fortunately now that's, that's almost 15 years now. And uh, now we have an amazing team. There's actually other people that aren't on this uh, uh, from lots of different backgrounds, whether it's product design or uh, anthropology or from um, uh, you know, all sorts of different backgrounds. And really we're sort of like a little creative think tank within this big city of the Jet Propulsion Lab. And uh, one of the first things that I worked on when I was there was this idea of finding planets around other stars. And uh, that's kind of crazy to think about. You see it in Star Trek and that sort of thing, but in real life we are finding planets around other stars. And, and they would give me all these big numbers, but I wasn't, I'm not good at math, and so <laughs> I couldn't quite understand it. So I had to create an experience for me to actually understand what they were talking about. <clears throat> and so uh, I, I found a grain of sand, a little mini grain of sand, and it was cool that I could take that to JPL and someone could drill a hole into it for me. <laughs> and so that's the grain of sand with that little hole in it. So the grain of sand represents the Milky Way galaxy. We live in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, we live in that little tiny area of the Milky Way galaxy. But within that little teeny tiny hole, we've also found thousands and thousands and thousands of other planets around other stars within that little teeny tiny area. And our technology is not very good right now, so we're gonna find tens of thousands of planets more within that little teeny tiny area, let alone the rest of the galaxy. And then you need, oh, let's see, you need like six rooms full, uh, about the size of this room, full of sand to show all the other galaxies that we know about. So I would have these uh, big you know, expanse of sand, and then this would be under a little magnifying glass, and, and you'd either get a sense of being really small and insignificant, or uh, hopefully you might also get a sense that maybe, maybe this is precious, what we have here. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, it's because um, every time I hear that, I still get chills thinking about like the, the scope of where we are and what we live and how little we know about what's, what's out there, possibly. Um, and in some ways, it kind of relates to this project. This, um, well, uh, let me start with um, not so long ago, uh, there was the director who um, originally hired Dan um, was going to retire, Dr. Charles Zalachi, who's been just a huge supporter of our studio and, and our work because he, he loves art and, of course, he loves science, but he loves seeing them mixed together. And he was going to leave. And he's a beloved figure at JPL and um, the... Uh, executive council asked us to do something for him, for him to go, or, like as a, as a gift. And uh, he's from Lebanon, and his story is really interesting. We found this article written up about him, about his journey from, from Lebanon as a boy, um, looking up at the stars and, and just wondering what could be up there. Naturally gifted at mathematics, and that led him all the way to Caltech, and eventually became the director of JPL. But um, just in looking at that story, we were thinking about, well, we're, you know, thinking about the culture of Lebanon, and we looked at the flag of Lebanon, and on the Lebanese flag, there's a tree. And I didn't know much about that tree, but it, we looked into it, and it turns out it's, it's something called the cedar of Lebanon. And the cedars of Lebanon have this huge history, which we're sort of jumping down the rabbit hole of what the significance and relevance of these trees. Um, the cedar of Lebanon was sort of the tree of kings and pharaohs back in the day, like 3,000 years ago. Um, you know, King Solomon's uh, temple was, was built with the cedars of Lebanon. The, the pharaohs would use the sap from that cedar for mummification. And um, it was widely considered the best building material of its time. It's a, you know, you, you, we still use it. The fragrance of cedar keeps bugs away. Um, but they unfortunately were sort of overused, and there's very few left. But there are still a few there. 
that um, are over 2,000 years old. And when you look at, at sort of the size of these great cedars, um, you start to see, you know, how big they can become. This is an illustration with these are people down here. And um, they have these sort of magnificent structures with these wide sort of reaching branches. And so a lot of times you'll hear about them written about as a metaphor for strength and, um, you know, endurance and lasting over time. Um, but, you know, when you look at, we, it was kind of funny, actually. So we had to say, where are we going to get the cedar of Lebanon? It's going to be great. You know, we called up the hunting scene. We were talking to the, the people in, there in charge of all the trees. And, you know, it, was, it turned out they were hard to get, you know. And we started calling by, like, the local nursery. And, you know, they didn't have any. But we kind of lucked out in a way because the people who um, were doing all the landscaping for JPL, they had this, this resource of, like, looking across the country for available trees. And they found three cedars of love. And we were really particular because... We didn't want any subspecies or wanted a particular Cedrus labani, like the kind of cedar of Lebanon that people refer to when they're talking about actually Lebanon. And, um, and we found three, and so we brought one down and we planted it. But it was kind of funny because when you think about like the, the history of the tree, you think you're going to get this magnificent tree. And in fact, what we got was this tree. And, <laughs> and it's really kind of funny because... You know, everybody thought it was going to be um, just a beautiful small tree, too. Like, but when you look at the comparison between the full-grown tree and this tree, there's a big difference. And we started to think, well, how appropriate. <laughs> that's so appropriate because we all start small. You know, this is a 14-year-old tree. Or this is what, yeah, 14 years old, 30 feet tall. And it looks sort of like a human 14-year-old, doesn't it? Like a little scraggly. Um, but um, what really started to resonate with us was the potential within the species of this tree, of what it can become. And it reminds me of Dan's um, uh, grain of sand, is that it's like we are small, but what can we become? You know, what can we turn into, given the right um, <clears throat> amount of dedication? Um, and so we started to think in that direction, and then all of a sudden this tree no longer represented uh, sort of this historical reference to Dr. Alachi's past. We wanted it to be something about our own future and his whole, whole uh, dedication to the future has been great it's what led the lab to what it has become now and um, we really thought it, to dedicate that we thought well what's the full grown tree going to look like you know and maybe one way we can do that is surround the tree with a, with a ring that marks the future diameter of that trunk of what it could become so right now it's an eight inch diameter but it could grow to nine feet in diameter and that will happen over a long period of time. They can last over 2,000 years, they grow. And what will we be able to have the strength and fortitude to allow it to grow that amount of time? Um, and a lot of that is, is um, JPL helps you know, with the science that will allow those types of things to happen. And so, you know, Dr. Alachi has always used the phrase, um, dare mighty things. And a lot of the time he's talking about dare, dare go to Mars, dare, you know, find all of these new things. Um, but we propose to dare is dare to allow this tree to grow and dare to allow us to have the intellect to allow the next 2,000 years to be a healthy growth period for this tree. And what will we become during that time? And, um, you know, this started really um, sort of this process of thinking about um, our participation in the sort of growth of ourselves. And uh, we thought it was sort of a, a nice uh, gift to him. It was actually very uh, unexpected for him. I think he was expecting like uh, something more along the technology <laughs> yeah. side. Uh, but he liked it. Um, you know, it's kind of funny. You think about like where will we, what will we turn into? Where will, you know, where will we be? Um, I borrowed this awesome pie chart. I love pie charts because, you know, a lot of times we'll be talking about corporate growth and things like that. This, this is the summary of everything that uh, we think is out there in the universe. Um, and it turns out what we actually, uh, most of the time, think about what the universe is is just a teeny tiny little piece of what's actually out there. Um, turns out, if you look at, if it, you know, try to sum it up in 100%, the majority of what's out there in the universe is dark energy right? And then dark matter. Now, 
I think most people would be fairly comfortable saying that we don't have a fully clear idea of what that is and how that all works, but uh, apparently the scientists are confident enough to make a pie chart. Um, <laughs> so I, I can't you know, give credit to any of this stuff, of, but, but if this is how it goes. So that's that, and then 3.6 intergalactic gas, and then that tiny little black sliver is um, what we think about what the universe is, which are stars and galaxies and all of that physical matter, is actually just a very, very small, small percent of what's there. And so when you think about that, it, it's kind of cool because it makes me feel, at least, really hopeful that there's so much more to discover. And it's not a matter of knowing everything right now because we are at just at the very, very beginning of understanding. And the process of science is, is an incredible aid to allowing us to understand these things. And so um, one of the ways that, uh, that we, th we think about this is when Dan and I found this quote, and we really love it, um, you know, uh, the universe is full of magical things patiently waiting for our wits to grow sharper. You know, it's almost like there's these things all around us, and we just don't have the uh, capacity at this point to fully understand their reality. And um, we, the, the word magical is kind of funny because sometimes that means like, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's like a little woo-woo, right? It's like, uh, but I like that term because it means that there's something special going on. There's something, the way I think about it is that there's something very special and these things are very special, right? But look how funny it is when you take the word magical out of it. The universe is full of things patiently waiting for our wits to go over. It's like, I don't think that would drive science forward, right? It's like, ah, uh, yeah, it's just a thing, you know? It's, it's kind of a funny thing. But, but I think that in, in a lot of ways, that's what we um, really try to uh, capture is the, the special qualities of, of these things and, and give those special things to people so that they can uh, have questions and, and want to know more and want to you know, separate that pie chart into a whole bunch of smaller chunks. Um, this is a magical thing we have. We just love it. If you think about the word magical, that's just very special and different. Um, this is Haley's Comet. Um, one of the things we learned uh, about comets in general, we're always going through continuous learning curves on every project, is that comets have these really solid, it's a solid nucleus in the middle of it, and they're made out of ice. And um, when they come near the sun, they, they, the ice starts to sublimate, and they leave these beautiful trails of, of, uh, of like gas, water vapor. And so when um, there was a comet coming close to Earth, um, Comet 67P, uh, the European Space Agency had uh, this idea they're going to go land on it, right? And uh, JPL was involved uh, peripherally. That we had three instruments that we contributed to the project, and so the leader of that project said, hey, can you guys do something to get people to think about comets? And we went through the whole ring of a roll of, of what we could do, you know, going into way too much detail, and then we just realized that probably the most compelling thing is just to allow people to see a tail grow. And that's what we ended up doing. If you go to the next slide, uh, we worked in collaboration with uh, Jason Klamoski of Studio KCA, and we created this installation um, that would uh, present people with uh, a very different kind of thing. Uh, something that they're not used to seeing, something that can't really be categorized very quickly, something that relates to the uh, <coughs> presence of water, um, but also something that um, not only would get people to ask questions, but something they could enjoy and find a little joy in. Um, this was in Brooklyn Bridge Park um, a, few, a couple of years ago. Um, but that aspect of providing people with a memory that they would take home and remember was a really big deal to us. When we saw this girl and these kids playing inside <laughs> the tail, um, it wasn't that important to us that they may not be equating it to what that is or what we're hoping that it is to people. It's not, it, but we wanted them to take that, in, that special memory home with them. Of course, it didn't hurt that, like, you know, improvisational dancers would show up and people would come and take their wedding pictures and things like that. So it was really fun. But, um, you know, getting people to leave wanting to know more in this day and age, there's so many ways to find out everything. Uh, we thought that it was more important to give the desire to figure things out than to give the answers themselves. I think we're going to... Oh.
Uh, okay, so it's good to go. Okay, yeah. Cool. Okay, okay. So we're gonna we're gonna skip a couple little things, but hopefully you've uh, has anyone been to the Huntington Library um, and seen Orbit Pavilion? And so um, basic idea here is that um, um, this is a seashell, but when you go inside, you don't hear the ocean. You hear the exact location of satellites that are going around the Earth. So NASA has 19 satellites that are orbiting the Earth, helping us understand our, 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 um, our world. And Jason Klamatsky was also, again, the architect on this. And Shane Mirbeck was, uh, uh, composed all the sounds. And so literally when you stand in the center and you hear a sound over there, that's exactly where a satellite is. And if you hear another one over there, then uh, you'll hear one over there. And uh, when it's not super hot, the iPad works, and it, and it tells you which uh, satellite you're, you're actually listening to. So um, this hasn't been announced yet, but it sounds like it might be there for another year. So I'm yes. uh, kind of excited about that. So. Now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shh, nobody knows. OK, okay we're, I'm, I'm going to have to skip a couple of things here. Hey, Susan. Yeah. I knew it. So, OK, so, um, so those are. Those are things that we do during the day, uh, during our full-time job uh, at, at JPL. Uh, we also get lots of strange emails, and uh, one time uh, I got an email saying, uh, Dan, there needs to be a museum of awe, and you should run it. And I was like, I was too busy, and, and uh, I was like, whatever, and, and, uh, <laughs> and then, which was stupid, right? And then later on, he was like, no, there needs to be a museum of awe, and you should run it. And, and uh, I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. <laughs> and uh, so I called David up, and, and we we're, were like, well, what, what is a Museum of Awe? And is it, is it like LACMA, you know, or is it something like that? I don't know, you know, I don't know. And, and so we we're like, uh, well, you know what? We're, the Museum of Awe has been around since the beginning of time, right? It is the oldest museum in existence because we live in the Museum of Awe. But we don't notice it because we're you know, doing this, and we've got to hurry up and microphone <clears throat> All that sort of stuff gets in the way of seeing the Museum of Awe, right? And so uh, we, we started to think, well, you know, how can we how can we help people see the world that's all around them that maybe they're they're busy and, and not seeing it? And and um, and so we thought, well, and also what kind of structure should this take? Maybe it's like an art museum, but it can't be pretentious. Uh, maybe it's like a science museum, but it can't feel like it's about facts and figures. It has to be about building that fire within your, your soul for curiosity. And maybe it's like a theater, but instead of being you know, in the audience, you're actually on the stage and musicians and actors are walking along with you and, and you're interacting with them. And uh, the subject matter could be anything from the stars and galaxies that you know, we talk about a lot to what may be more interesting, the weird little objects that are in your kitchen that you just never looked at quite this right way to be able to see what awe is actually going on down deep in, in between. Or maybe it's also about the human condition. Because no matter what the news has to say today, whenever I see humans do something and sacrifice for another human, it, uh, it always brings out the awe inside of me. And so the goal of this museum is that when you are done, you are reminded of what a gift and privilege it is to be alive. And just real quickly here to show you guys kind of what's going on down here. This is something that, that reminds me of this. This is called a cloud chamber. Um, you guys can look it up online. And um, yeah, yeah. Um, you can look it up online. These things are easy to make. You can make it at home. It doesn't cost very much money. Um, but what's happening is it's really cold down here and it's warm up here. And there's isopropyl alcohol in here. And uh, what happens is over time, you end up seeing a little tiny fog. But the fog is not w what's important. Watch for little streaks. Oh you gosh. see those streaks? Yeah. So those streaks are particles that have come from stars that have exploded. <laughs> so millions of years ago, star exploded. And uh, it's the particles all over the place. And some of them get to our solar system, some of them get to Earth, some of them get to Art Center, and then fly through this little tiny box. And for a fraction of a second, they prove to us that there's an invisible world that is all around us. And it's not only around us, but through us, because millions of these things are flying through you and me right this second. Right? I, I get, I, I've done this a million times. I get goosebumps every single time. 
So our bodies are made of atoms, atoms that used to be in a star that exploded, and then another star exploded, and another star exploded, and eventually there's dust all around, and some of that dust came together and became big and became hot, and that became our sun. And then some of it, some of the atoms became our planets, some of them became Earth. Some of them became animals. But at this moment in galactic history, <laughs> some of these atoms have become you and have become me. What we do together is meaningful and is a gift and a privilege to be alive. And that's what stirs us when we wake up. We have that voice inside of our head that says, what are you going to do with your brief moment in time? Thank you, guys.